Welcome to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we explore how to build freedom through the entrepreneurial process. Our goal is to provide you with the tools and mindset needed to create your lifestyle of independence and flexibility. I'm your host, Ash Whitener, and this is Episode 10, Financial Freedom and Exiting the Rat Race, with our guest, Jake DeSilla. We chat about a range of topics, including transitioning from university to starting a business, which Jake believes is the most intense personal development program you can put yourself through. Please follow us on Twitter, at Liberty E Podcast, and Facebook, slash Liberty Entrepreneurs. Show notes are found on our website, libertyentrepreneurs.com. Enjoy the show. Jake DeSillis is the host of The Voluntary Life, a podcast about entrepreneurship, financial independence, and freedom. In 2000, he founded Intelligent Space, an award-winning consultancy firm that led innovation in the field of pedestrian movement simulation and analysis. In 2010, he sold his business, quit the rat race, and retired early at the age of 38. He has a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and a doctorate, and is dedicated to promoting entrepreneurship both as an effective personal liberation program that is available to everyone and as a peaceful method of solving social problems. Jake, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's my pleasure. So, Jake, I read a book that you wrote uh, about, I would say, six months ago or so called Becoming an Entrepreneur, and it was it really affected me. I, I appreciate it a lot. I was in a transitional period of getting out of being an angry libertarian, and i got to say that your book, Becoming an Entrepreneur, was a big turning point for me and really inspired me to start the podcast. Well, that's awesome. It's great to hear. So, Jake, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I mean, I started a business uh, from university. I I spent quite a while in university after doing my degree. I did a master's and then a PhD. And I was uh, learning about using computer modeling and simulation. And I started a business using some of the tools that I was using in my in my research at university and it was a uh, consultancy advising on pedestrian movement we were advising developers and transport uh, engineers on how to predict pedestrian flows using uh, computer models so we basically um, provided consulting work um, on urban development projects like if someone was building a shopping center working out how to get pedestrian flows on all levels and that kind of thing and uh, that was in 2000. So I started uh, a business in 2000 with uh, one p- business partner, um, made a lot of mistakes, learned a lot along the way, um, but eventually uh, built the business up to uh, uh, a nice uh, level of profit and, and income. And, and eventually I sold the business to a large engineering company. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Well, congratulations. Can you give us an idea of like how you got into following pedestrian movement or how did how did this become an interest to you? Well, originally, uh, I when I was doing my undergraduate degree, I have a background in economics and I was doing an undergraduate degree uh, in the early 90s, uh, just after Berlin was reunified. Mm. And I kept going out to Berlin. I had some friends there and I just thought it was an amazing city. And there was a lot going on, and so I wanted to work in Berlin. And I actually got a job there as a property market analyst, where I was um, uh, analyzing changes in rental patterns. But one of the amazing things about Berlin was that, you know, everything was changing. There, there had been a wall through the city, and the wall was removed. So incredible, it's almost like a bizarre social experiment. What mm. happens when you put a wall through a city and then take it away? And so everyone was trying to get their heads around how the property market in Berlin was changing. And I, I had known about these uh, computer modeling tools um, uh, back at my university, which were used to analyze street networks. So I got involved in using these kind of computer tools to analyze the street network of Berlin and how it changed, how certain streets became more or less accessible. And eventually the, the property market in Berlin crashed and everyone who had come from all over Europe to work there went back home and, and because there was no more work there. It, it sort of, the market changed. So I went back to London 
But one of the real opportunities for me was to continue working with these type of computer simulation tools that I'd been using on the street network of Berlin. And, and one of the main applications of, the, of that type of computer accessibility modeling was in predicting pedestrian flows, because pedestrians obviously walk around networks and uh, are sensitive to things like what they can see and how accessible different streets are. And so you can use uh, tools of that kind to look at how a design is likely to uh, basically channel flows in one way or another. And that's sort of how I got interested in that. And I did some research for a while at the university and there was a little consulting unit within the university that I was doing consulting work at. But I thought that there was just a bigger opportunity than a kind of consulting unit within a university with very much a kind of academic uh, priorities. I, I thought there was an opportunity to make a real business out of using these tools. So I, when I finished my PhD, I left the university and I developed some software to, to, to take what I'd learned and apply it um, on consulting projects. And the real opportunity was in pedestrian flows. So that's what we focused on. You were in a consultancy position within the university, but yeah. it was concentrating more on the academic side of it. And you, as as now as an entrepreneur, you back even back then you were able to see like, hey, this actually has as market value, and it's not just for learning or the academics of seeing or anticipating the pedestrian flow. Like, if I have this knowledge, let's go out and sell it to people. Who would be a typical client of yours? Uh, so, the the clients that I tended to work with most were shopping center developers. So basically, if you imagine you're, you, you're a property developer, you're going to build a shopping center and you make money from renting to, to retailers, you want to make sure that you have enough pedestrians on all levels of your, your shopping mall, basically. And so uh, I worked a lot with shopping center developers, but we also did work on transport schemes, hmm. looking at new street designs and road crossings and intersections. And uh, on, we worked a lot with architects on big urban development projects. If they were designing a new area of a city, uh, we'd do uh, an analysis to see, you know, what well, if you want to put a shopping street in this plan, where, how is it best connected, and is it going to work? That that kind of oh, thing. Oh, okay. So I mean, you were finding and analyzing pedestrian flows externally of the the buildings, but as well as internally yeah. to try to make to try to make all of the property within a mall, for instance, um, as high as possible. Yeah, because pedestrian flows are a resource for face-to-face -face retail. If you, if you want shops, you have to have enough foot traffic to get people into those shops. And one of the problems with a lot of shopping centers that don't work or malls that don't work is that they may have one area that works really well. There's a lot of flows, but people don't go up to the upper levels or they just don't find some bits that are kind of out of the way. And I mean, to go into a little bit more technical detail, basically one of the things that we looked at was what pedestrians can see mm. as they move around, because it turns out that that is actually quite a good predictor of where you're going to get pedestrian flows. And so we built various models to analyze that, and that helped us to advise on how to optimize uh, plans for pedestrian movement. Yeah, that, that's really neat. Um, I mean, I see three different levels of pedestrian movement now that you're saying this. like. The external pedestrian movement just getting people into the area right getting mm. down a certain street or in a certain parking lot or something then once they're in the mall getting them you know circulating the mall and making sure that they're seeing all the storefronts that they can but what about inside the actual stores themselves like do they put you know some of the most popular items in the back so you so like women have to walk past all the kids in the men's section to get back to where they're going to do their shopping as well? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a huge field working out how to optimize interior shop design. And uh, we did get involved in analyzing inside stores too. And there, there is a lot of uh, stuff that you can do in terms of where you place things. Uh, but the main focus of my consultancy was more on the bigger scale design questions of like how are we going to connect this new center to the surrounding street network and how are we going to connect the different levels together and that kind of thing. Right. So you did this in Germany. Uh, no, actually, this my business was based in London. Oh, okay. okay. Um, uh, after I left Berlin, I came back to London 
and uh, I set up the business there in 2000. And the thing is with urban development, often you have architects and engineers working on projects internationally. So we did a lot of work all over the world. Mm. Wherever there was a big project, we would often be brought in by the architects or the engineers to advise on the project. Okay. And you started this how long after you finished university? Oh, straight out of university. I mean, I did a PhD, right? So mm. I was in university for a long time doing some consultancy and finishing my PhD. But pretty much as soon as I handed in my PhD, I left. Yeah, what was that like? Give us an idea of what your mindset was from staying for so long in academia to going out and now becoming an entrepreneur. That's that's quite a difference. Yeah, well, I mean, I really didn't know, sort of, I didn't have like a grand master plan about starting this business. I, I was interested in different things. Uh, I was, as I said, I was very interested in Berlin and I wanted to go and live there. So I got a job there and then I got interested in how I could use some of the kind of technology that I'd learned about in university in that in that uh, role. And then I got interested in how I could continue um, doing something interesting with, with new technology. I was very interested in software and that kind of thing. But I think um, more than anything else, I saw, because there was a small consultancy unit within the university, I got a chance to work on really interesting projects from within the university. But as I said, I saw an opportunity to do more and to make it more of a real commercial focus as opposed to something that was kind of kind of an add-on to the research of the university and that seemed to me like a, a really exciting opportunity but also really I was really excited by the idea of being my own boss and doing things my way and, and working out you know actually just having the freedom to create an organization and create a, a, a a venture that was doing something that I thought was really interesting and important, but also doing it in a way that made sense to me and that reflected the way that I wanted to to manage my time and work out what we were doing and decide what, how to prioritize projects and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, this is a big part of what I want to put in this show, Liberty Entrepreneurs, is whenever you become an entrepreneur, become your own boss for, for whatever reasons you have, like it opens up your time and opens up your control of your finances and do you want to network more one day or do you want to sit down and code or do you want to read a, a manual of something can you walk us through some of the thoughts that you were having whenever you first started your company and what it was like to all of a sudden hey I just got out of university when my time was dictated a lot to now controlling all of my time what type of freedom or perspective did that give you before Jake answers that question, if you enjoy and appreciate what we're doing at Liberty Entrepreneurs and you would like to support our cause, then head on over to our website, libertyentrepreneurs.com. We're working with ShapeShift and have implemented the Shifty button so that you can donate $1 to our podcast in any cryptocurrency or altcoin that you favor. So head on over there and help out the cause. An entrepreneur definitely needs capital. All right, back to the show. I think it's the most intense personal development program that you can put yourself through. Starting a business is incredibly exciting, stressful as well. And um, I was very ignorant of a lot of the challenges that I was going to face when I started. I mean, in a way, I thought, this is going to be awesome. This is a great opportunity. How hard can it be? You know, <laughs> And you learn by doing just how much you don't know right. about business. And I really didn't know very much about business when I started. And in a way, I think the the fact that I sort of was had a willingness to jump in and give it a go meant that I could learn the things that I really needed to learn. Mm -hmm. And I believe that actually you learn a lot more through the doing of entrepreneurship than you do by theorizing about it in advance and kind of, you know, doing, doing an MBA or something like that. I think it actually entrepreneurship is very much a practice and it's a question of, of learning by doing so I mean I learned about everything I, I, I had to learn about uh, financial controlling and accounts and selling and how to work with people you know that's this is another thing it's an incredibly interesting process when you when you're running your own business you have to negotiate everything with everyone the whole time both with people who you want to work for you and with people who you want to to purchase your your services what was one point in intelligent space where you were like i just don't know if i'm going to get past this well i think really the first year the the biggest sort of thing that that came home to me in, in the first year was that you know we started and we spent a lot of money i mean i spent all my savings on developing software and doing you know creating cool products that we thought everyone would be interested in 
And then I realized that, you know, actually, it's completely different. It's not like you build something really interesting and then the world comes knocking on your door because you're so awesome and they want to buy your stuff. It's like you actually have to go out there and sell. And if you don't, then nothing is going to happen. And nobody, I mean, everyone's got stuff to deal with in their own lives. Nobody's interested in your mm. new business unless you go out there and actually make it happen. And selling was something that was, you know, academia especially, you don't have to sell at all. You're completely insulated from the market in that respect. So that was kind of the biggest thing for me was realizing that the fun stuff, the stuff that I wanted to do, like develop software and work on our website and this kind of stuff, that doesn't sell. What sells is actually making contact and working out what do customers need? How can I actually help people? And how can I find a way to actually engage with the marketplace? And that's a very different skill set and a very different mindset. And so, you know, we burned through a lot of money before we really focused on what we had to, which was how are we going to sell? What do customers really want? And I went through a big change when I actually started talking to shopping center developers who hadn't hired us yet to basically say, how can I get you to hire me? I mean, in, in, not in so many words, right, but right. I had those conversations and eventually found some some actually really great clients who we, we uh, managed to do some work extremely cheaply for them, but on a very interesting project that gave us a uh, chance to show the value that we could add. And once we had a, f a couple of reference projects, which we'd done really cheaply, but had shown what we can deliver, that started the ball rolling. And then we started to develop other ways to sell through partnering arrangements and, and other ways that we could actually really find a way to scale the business. But that was the big thing for me was changing my priorities and, and actually realizing that when I first started, I wasn't working on the things that were really important. Yeah, I remember that in your book, you, you would talk about how you can build an amazing product. But if you're not able to communicate the value and to sell it to someone, your amazing product is going to end up, you know, vaporware, like we yeah. say in the software world. Yeah. Sales has such a bad reputation. But what is sales? Sales is negotiation. Sales, for me, with my sales experience, I would just ask you questions. Be like, hey, I need to find out if it's going to benefit both of us to work together. Yeah. Because if it's not going to benefit you and I'm pushing it onto you, I think that's why sales has a bad reputation. But if you're developing a product like you have and you go up to a mall and you're like, hey, tell me what some of your pains are. This is where I see my value. I see some of these pains that you have. You know, you've got stores on your fourth floor that you're not renting out. You have a whole row of, of shops that change every six months. I can help you increase the value of the rent or the storefront property value and you will have a more successful business. Do you want to enter into a successful partnership with me? Yeah. The selling is learning. That's the key thing for me was that selling is how you learn what it is that you can really provide. And often the things that you think you can provide are not exactly what your customers really right, want. Right. And that there's a humility that you have to actually mm. realize that, okay, well, I thought this was really an epic thing that I was doing, but actually nobody's interested in that. But they are really interested in a variation on it. Right. That's a little different, but actually is going to help them a lot more. And so, you know, th there's you, you have to work out how to do it, what it is that you want to do, but also find a way to engage with what other people want you to do. Yeah, because the value that the market sees in your product may not be the value that you initially see in your product. Right. right? I right. mean, I, I've been a part of a startup where we thought we had just a wonderful idea and everybody's going to use this because we thought it was so amazing. Then when we started pitching the idea, the feedback we got was, uh, I see more value in this. Yeah. And, right? and we, we had, like you said, we had to have the humility to step back and be like, Okay, well, maybe we were wrong. Let's mm. think about this again. I think that's a very important trait for yeah. a successful entrepreneur. I mean, that's what happened to me because I wanted to create an online application service provision model. I wanted to basically sell software as a service. And I thought engineers and developers could take our software and run the kind of computer modeling and simulation of flows themselves. But actually, they didn't want to do that. They wanted us to give them the answer. And that's not what I initially wanted to get into because that's consulting, mm -hmm. right? And I thought software would be much more scalable. But after a while, you realized like, okay, look, the market is not there for what it is that we're trying to sell. But there is a market for the solution that right. our software provides. And that's why I actually changed the business and pivoted into consulting. So talk to us a bit about exiting the company and selling the company. And this has got to be an exciting time. What was it like to sell your company? And then give us an idea of how life changed after you sold the company. I mean, selling was something that 
was basically one of the most important turning points in my life. You know, when you start a business, uh, I I, re I put everything into that business, and it was it was a huge struggle building it to profitability. And I really cared about the business, but I also really wanted the opportunity to do other things as well. And selling was a, a, an amazing experience because it meant that it gave me the freedom to do other things afterwards. And uh, you know, it was definitely the, the most important negotiation in my in my career was that that negotiation. And um, I think it's also a bittersweet thing because it's difficult selling, and you you do see when you give when you give up ownership of your company, you see the new owners making decisions that you might not make mm. and doing things that you wouldn't necessarily agree with, and you have to be able to to let go and and see some things happen that you actually really would not want to happen to your company. So that's tough, that side yeah. of it. Um, so it's a strange process. It's kind of bittersweet, but um, but you know it has given me the opportunity to explore other exciting things. You know, living here now in Panama, writing books, doing my podcast, The Voluntary Life, lots and lots of fun stuff that I I have the freedom to do. Yeah, so, well, let's let's talk about your book because I found it incredibly interesting. It was, you know, the writing style was very easy to digest and it had a passion to it that you could tell that you were excited to write the book. How did you get into that mindset? How did you make the decision to write and get a book published? I've heard it's quite difficult. Well, you know, you talked about the the idea behind your podcast, and I mean, in a way, I I can really really um, that really resonates with me because when I sold my business, I wanted to try and encourage other people to think about entrepreneurship as an opportunity to gain more freedom because that's to me the most important things in life is is having freedom i'm i'm really interested in how i can live as freely as possible and i see entrepreneurship as the way to achieve real tangible freedom in life you know what matters is the freedom that you can really experience in your own life right the individual, individual freedom exactly Absolutely. individual freedom on a day to day level that's what you can have an impact on and that's what you can change and by doing so that's how you can also inspire other people to, to live more free themselves so after I sold on I had the opportunity in the free time I wanted to write becoming an entrepreneur to partly to, to sort of try to express for people who had asked me about uh, starting a business and selling a business and the ideas that, that had helped me to express those ideas to them and also just to to really encourage people to think about entrepreneurship as as a, a path to more freedom and I think it's such a productive thing to focus on that rather than to focus on you know more abstract kinds of freedom that you can never really control is that you know you can have no impact mm -hmm. on politics on the really big scale right. but you can change your own life and in doing so you can have a fundamentally positive impact on the world because I also believe that entrepreneurship is a an incredible force for positive change in the world it's through entrepreneurs that we get all of the positive benefits of social change that we've seen in terms of greater standard of living, in terms of uh, you know more opportunity and freedom that, that comes from economic growth, basically. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at the root of it, what is an entrepreneur trying to do, right? And this is something that I, I asked myself for a long time. Entrepreneurs are trying to find pains in society. They're trying to find what is a problem that I can solve. It's very similar to my engineering background, right? You know, we're looking for problems and then we're looking for solutions, it just happens that the entrepreneur is looking for someone else's pain so that they can solve it and then you know, hopefully generate wealth, not only for them, but happiness for someone else. L let's say that I, I break my leg and I, I'm stuck in a bed for six weeks. Well, I have a pain that I can't get up and maybe cook and I can't go to a restaurant. An entrepreneur could see that and start a, a, a food delivery business for me, like, like we have a ton of them here in Panama, right? And so if there's no pain, then an entrepreneur has a difficult time building a business. And I feel like a lot of entrepreneurs can develop a neat product, but a neat product isn't going to solve a pain that it's not going to stay around for a long time. Absolutely. And I, I agree with you about how entrepreneurs are creating wealth and actually providing freedom in your personal life. And that, that is the theme of this show. Too many like libertarian oriented people that I know are so worried about providing freedom for everyone. If I could just end the Fed, then <laughs> everyone is going to be free. But what can you control? You can control your own life. And if you're creating freedom in your own life, then people are going to see you creating freedom and they're going to want to emulate you instead of trying to fight against the police or the 
the welfare state or the war in Iraq or something. It's like, it's very similar to stoicism in the sense that control what you can control and don't try to control what you can't control because you're just going to burn out. Yeah, and this is the way that you can see tangible change happen through your own efforts. You can actually see yourself making an impact on making the world a better place because you, you can know that if people are helped by your products and they're willing to pay for them, they demonstrate that, that you're actually making their lives better because right. they're, they're actually willing to pay for it. And in doing so, you create value for, for yourself and for them. And it's a, a great example of win-win. You know, it's an opportunity for everybody to actually improve their lives uh, without anybody being ripped off, basically. So, Jake, tell us now that you have sold your business and we're here in Panama in what seems to be a, a phone booth. <laughs> yeah. uh, we, we had to find a little quiet space here in Panama and that's quite difficult with so many people and so much traffic. But what are you doing with your time now and how has being an entrepreneur and then being a successful entrepreneur and selling your business, how has that created more freedom for you now? Well, I mean, it's really been a great opportunity for me to do whatever I want with my time and whatever has most meaning for me. And at the moment, that's writing. Mm. So I've written um, Becoming an Entrepreneur and, and that's out. And I'm currently working on my second book, which is about different ways to quit the rat race, different job-free lifestyles. And um, so that's coming out soon. And that's what I find fulfilling. Um, but also, you know, my wife and I both really like to travel. So we're here because, you know, we've taken the opportunity. We don't have to be in England. And England is cold and expensive. And so, you know, we're, we're now living in Panama and we may live in other places too. You know, we're just taking the opportunity to see uh, different parts of the world and uh, experience different cultures and so forth. And so the great thing is, is that um, I've, I've also realized that one of the things that entrepreneurship has given me, because it's given me financial independence, it's an opportunity to then pursue goals that are really meaningful to me and things that that bring me fulfillment. And that's what writing is for me at the moment. Yeah. And doesn't your wife, hasn't she written a book about journaling? Yeah, that's you, right. You she, want to plug that she, real quick? Yeah, yeah. She has a website called Becoming Who You Are. And she writes about personal development. Uh, she's a coach and, and, and uh, is a... Uh, very much involved in the personal development world so she's written a book about journaling called the ultimate guide to journaling and, and she's actually got loads of other books but yeah you can find her on becoming who you are.net yeah well i i actually bought her book and i'm, I'm reading it as well i cool you know, journaling is one of those things that for some reason i i have a hiccup about doing it it's it, it and she mentions this in the book a lot like one of the hardest parts about journaling is actually getting to the habit of journaling mm. there, there's a there's a brick wall there a mental brick wall and i through therapy and journaling, like I'm starting to figure out like why I have this resistance to journaling. But I, yeah, I hope to meet her sometime once I, once yeah, I read more of the book. I'd like absolutely. to share Absolutely. It's interesting. It's funny because um, I read a, a, a nice book by an entrepreneur called Derek Sivers, who I admire and I think he's a very uh, interesting character. And he also sold his business. Um, but he wrote about journaling in that book and he wrote about different entrepreneurial challenges that he faced and that he used journaling when he was kind of mulling things over. I'm a bit like you. It took me a long time to get mm. into journaling, but I do find it very helpful too. Yeah. So can you give us, what was some of your motivation to take the risk of becoming an entrepreneur? Because you could have easily just worked for someone. You know, I'm sure you'd have been very successful. I mean, you're obviously a smart guy. You, you have a PhD. You know, what, what helped you take the risk of becoming an entrepreneur rather than just you know, entering into the rat race? I think for me, entrepreneurship has always been an opportunity to follow what you believe in, what you're interested in, and a chance to do what you think is the most important and interesting way to live your life. And so I know a lot of people think about entrepreneurship as a way of making money, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's great. It's nice to make money, and, and it is, uh, it, it, that, that side of entrepreneurship is, is really important. But I think for me, the motivation was always more to do with the freedom that it gave me to do what I think is important. Living a job-free life, being outside that kind of career path of working for other people is so fulfilling because you get to choose what you do. And it requires a lot of responsibility too, because you make a lot of mistakes and it's, you know, the, and it's all your fault, basically. Right. And the buck stops with you. And so you have to take responsibility for, for having that freedom. But that's what appealed to me was the, the chance to do things um, on, my, on my initiative 
so that I could experience, you know, what am I capable of doing? You know, how would I choose to organize things if this was my business? And that was what I found most exciting. Yes, that control that you have over your own life and your decisions. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I, I really appreciate that perspective. You know, being in control is a sense of peace and is a sense of freedom. And so if you're always taking orders and you feel trapped because you have to always listen to what others, someone else is saying or that they're delegating tasks to you all the time, you know, I can see why people would start getting resentful towards, you know, their bosses, for instance, instead of seeing it as a win-win scenario, which in the marketplace it is. If you're working for someone, it's still a win-win scenario. But when you're an entrepreneur, like you said, the buck does stop with me. Yeah, and I think the other thing is that some people don't like this aspect of it, but I always thought it's just an awesome adventure. You know, starting your own business, it's stressful, it's difficult, and it, there is a lot of failure. You know, you will experience a lot of failure and a lot of people, um, you know, find that aspect of entrepreneurship to be to be really stressful. But I just also think, you know, life's too short not to try and see what you're capable of achieving. And if you have a strong sense of purpose and you, you see an opportunity uh, to start a business and provide real value, it's a great adventure to do so. Yeah. Can you tell us what characteristics do you think make a successful entrepreneur? Well, I think there's different aspects of characteristics. I mean, there's some things that you need uh, if your business is going to succeed. And there are other things that you need personally, you know, in terms of your own personality. I mean, it just in practical terms, you need to understand uh, the industry that your business is, is working in. You need to actually understand how money flows in that industry and how you can plug into it. You also need to understand and empathize with your customers and know what they really need and so that you can serve them properly because otherwise we, you get into that problem that we talked about where you're making a product that you think is really cool but right. nobody else does. Right. And you do need to have valuable technical expertise of some kind to provide something that is rare and valuable. So there are those kind of technical things but I think on the personality side there are all different there are lots of different types of entrepreneurs like there are more introverted or extroverted so I don't think that is necessarily um, you don't have to be one particular type of person but I think you do have to be incredibly resilient you know you've got to be able to come back after failure and especially after embarrassment entrepreneurship is super embarrassing sometimes <laughs> you know you make a lot of mistakes things don't work out and if that kind of thing is going to stop you um, or, or you know annoying people right. you're going to annoy people if you're an entrepreneur too yeah. if that's going to stop you then you won't get anywhere so I think you need to be incredibly resilient but you also I think you need to have a strong sense of purpose about what it is that you're trying to do to get you through the hard times because there will be hard times and ultimately you can't, you need to be an optimist mm. you know if if you don't see that that there's an, a way through setbacks if you don't have that optimistic outlook then uh, it's really hard to to get through because there's always something as an entrepreneur that that you're going to fail at you're always going to be failing and if you're taking those failures personally and just not seeing obstacles as opportunities then, you know, there's infinite reasons to get down on yourself and just throw up your arms and quit and say, oh, the, you know, they, they can't see the value in my product yeah. or, the, you know, the world's out to get me or something like that. Yeah. Um, what, what advice would you give young or inexperienced entrepreneurs? Um, I guess it depends what stage people are at. I think what we talked about earlier on is about selling is, is really important. You know, the sooner you can get to selling something, and understanding is anyone going to buy this then the better and that's really what the whole um, concept of minimum viable product is that mm. comes from the lean startup movement which I think is a very helpful approach yeah. to think about okay what's the what what's the first thing that I could do to actually make something I can sell and see if anyone's interested in it right and so I, that I think is a very helpful approach to um, getting out there and and selling it the other thing that I would say is to really think carefully about whether or not you're going to go for financing because a lot of people get stuck in the process of just looking for financing and if you can find a way to grow your business through revenue to finance yourself through revenue by first of all selling something that's you know 
really crappy but and not what you want it to be but it's the first start that you can right. at least bring in some revenue and then incrementally growing your business that way you have so much more freedom and control that way compared to if you take large amounts of investment because often you know you're going to get involved in different requirements for, from your investors from what you may have as a vision for the company yourself you may not even spend that money well so right. you might take on a whole load of investment and just waste it right. whereas if you're funding through revenue you're always going to be pointing in the right direction because you're always going to be very customer focused and so i did take on large loans and you know i took on personal loans as well so I had a lot of debt to pay off um, as I built my company. But what I realized after a while was that I actually didn't need some of those loans because having the loans enabled me to mess around on stuff that I didn't really need to focus on. Right. And, and if you're focused on creating revenue for your minimum viable product, then you know that's market feedback already. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So it points you in the right direction. It makes you look at customers rather than trying to suck up to investors. Right. Basically. Instead of saying, hey, I've got a million dollars in the bank. We can build this and this. Oh, this could be a little more complex. Or let's add this feature instead of like making a fat bloated piece of software, for instance. Right. You can say, hey, people already like this and I, I know how I can make it a lot better, but they already like like this yeah exactly if you take on a million bucks you know you're gonna be drinking coconut water and renting nice offices and spending money on stuff that's ultimately not gonna build your business you right, know? right 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 <laughs> so let's let's have some rapid-fire questions here Jake sure um, take as much time as you need but number one can you share a tool or a shortcut or a hack that helped you succeed yeah a tool that I think you need to build as quickly as possible is a forward cash flow planning tool. It doesn't sound very interesting, but um, basically you have to know. I mean, I really didn't know accounts very well, um, but when I started, the thing that you really must understand is cash flow. That is what will kill your business. So the sooner you have forward cash flow planning really set up properly, you know how much money is coming in next week, next month, and as far forward as possible, then the more control you have over your business. So if if you don't know how to do that, then get somebody to help you. But get on get in control of your cash flow and understand your forward cash flow projections as quickly as possible. And were there any pieces of software you used or that you can recommend to help people plan their cash flow? You know, we had an accounting um, package at the time uh, that we used within my business, which I didn't even particularly like. But actually, the most useful thing that we did was we built an Excel spreadsheet mm. with for our forward cash flow planning. And it was custom designed so that we could actually... Um, put in different uh, stages of the sales process and we would know how, exactly how much revenue was coming in and so forth. So, you know, there's lots of different ways of doing it, but we, we used the spreadsheet and uh, it really worked very well and it helped us get control of cash flow. Yeah, that's great. What is uh, an influential book in your life? Mine was Becoming an Entrepreneur. What, <laughs> what, what, what was one for you? Lots of influential books. Um, uh, how I Found Freedom in an Unfree World by Harry Brown was incredibly influential, and especially about entrepreneurship too. That book is one of the books that started me thinking about selling my business hmm. um, because he talks about a lot about entrepreneurship in that book, and he talks about the importance of, of ha being as free as possible and looking at practical ways that you can achieve that. Um, so that, was, that, that book was, was very influential on me in a broad philosophical sense, but also specifically to do with entrepreneurship. Within entrepreneurship, Lots of books have been influential on me too. Um, another one is Getting to Yes by Fisher and Yuri, which is about negotiation. Okay. That was an incredibly helpful tool for me to get my head around how to be more productive in negotiation and how to, to really basically improve my negotiation skills. Sure. And as always, I'll put uh, links to these books down in the show notes. Cool. Who is an influential entrepreneur or role model that you've had, that you have? Um... Well, as I mentioned Harry Brown, uh, mm -hmm. he was very much a role model for me, um, both in terms of entrepreneurship and in terms of thinking about financial independence. And, and tell the audience who may not be familiar with Harry Brown, it may be a younger yeah, audience. Yeah, he, so he was a, um, he's dead now, but he was a, a libertarian investment advisor and a writer, um, and he did loads of things in his life. He even ran for president as mm -hmm. a libertarian candidate once, I think. Um, but he... He wrote a book called How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World, which is a kind of philosophy of, of, of uh, personal liberty. Um, but he also, because he had ran various businesses, he writes a lot about entrepreneurship in that book. 
Um, but he mainly writes about how to get more freedom in your own life. And as I said, that was, so he was kind of a role model for me in terms of thinking about how to achieve more freedom in, in my life. In terms of entrepreneurs, I mentioned Derek Sivers, who wrote the book, Anything You Want. He's really interesting. And uh, there's a lot of ideas in that book that um, I learned from. Um, so I think that's a, a very thought provoking book. I also like, um, I remember when I first started my business, I read um, Richard Branson's autobiography. Mm. And I think that's a, an interesting book just because he's kind of epic in terms of the yeah. things that he's actually done. Sure. So um, that that's a fun one too. So I usually ask my guests, what blog or podcast do you listen to? But tell us a bit about your podcast. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so my podcast is called The Voluntary Life. And it's really about this question of how to get more freedom in your life, in particular through entrepreneurship, but also through financial independence and, and through personal freedom too. And so I've done a lot of interviews with people who found different ways of getting more freedom and living a job-free life, um, both through entrepreneurship, but others who've, who've adopted their own strategies, like people who've um, saved a huge amount of their salaries as employees and then gained financial independence that way. Mm -hmm. And other people who do things like unjobbing, where they have lots of different income streams and get more freedom or lifestyle businesses. So you can find that at thevoluntarylife.com. Uh, and um, yeah, that's. I, th I think that should be interesting for your audience. Yeah, I, I mean, I would love to for you to repost this interview as well. Um, sure. I find it really interesting. Just the name, the voluntary life, is is wonderful. But also, you concentrate a lot on financial independence. Yeah. Which is something that I feel, of course, isn't taught in school. But it takes people a long time to figure out. Like, I'm, I'm spending three thousand dollars a month to live. How can I generate three thousand dollars a month for cash flow, and then I'm free? Yeah, exactly. I, I control my time now. But you know, if I have to work ten hours a week to do something, I have some passive income to bring in a thousand dollars. But then I'm literally free at that point. So, and and Jake has over two hundred episodes on his podcast. So, uh, a, a hat tip to that, Jake. I, I really appreciate what you're doing here. Thanks so much for being on the show. If you'd like to plug anything or give contact details, I think that'd be wonderful. Yeah, thanks, Ash. It's been really fun talking to you. As I said, the the, uh, the website for my podcast is thevoluntarylife.com. My book is called Becoming an Entrepreneur, and you can find that on Amazon or linked through the website. And by all means, contact me through through the website. There's, there's social media links and stuff there too. Yeah, and give your the name of your wife's book as well. Uh, yes, she's written lots, but uh, the one that we spoke about is The Ultimate Guide to Journaling by Hannah Brain. Great. I'll include all those links. Jake, thank you so much. Thanks, Ash. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to like, comment, and share our podcast. If you know someone that you think would be a good interview for Liberty Entrepreneurs, shoot us an email at info at libertyentrepreneurs.com or feel free to get in touch with us on our Facebook page slash Liberty Entrepreneurs. We love the introduction. Thank you so much. See you next week.